And good morning, everyone. What an exciting uh, a morning for this to be happening. I want to thank you uh, for joining us today uh, for <laughs> National Indigenous Peoples Day. We're gathering virtually today for an important teaching about land acknowledgement, why we do it. This morning's webinar is an initiative of the OFL's First Nations Métis Inuit Circle. As settlers and descendants of settlers, we must recognize the legacy and the long lasting harmful effects of colonization. We are too often unfamiliar with the ongoing harm done to indigenous peoples. The horrific discovery of the remains of 215 precious indigenous children at one of the largest residential schools followed by the discovery of another 104 precious souls in Brandon, Manitoba has brought shock, rage and sorrow. This discovery has also re-traumatized many indigenous families and communities. While we are thankful for the opportunity to hold today's virtual gathering on Turtle Island, we must recommit to supporting the indigenous led calls to fully implement all of the Truth and Reconciliation's reports 94 calls to action and deepen our knowledge of Canada's colonial past and present. Before we move into our formal agenda, I'd like to review our quality safe space statement. The Ontario Federation of Labour is committed to providing an inclusive, positive environment for all Federation activities and ensuring that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity. We will not tolerate hateful messages from attendees that are racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or ableist, nor any language that is discriminatory or violent in its intent or personal attacks. As such, we reserve the right to expel any attendees from our event that contribute to this type of behavior. The OFL's policies and practices must reflect our collective commitment to equality. Our work must demonstrate that all persons deserve dignity, equality, and respect. So I, on behalf of the uh, OFL President Patty Coates and OFL Secretary Treasurer Ahmed Gaid and the entire staff of the OFL, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. This morning, I am joined by the members, by members of the OFL First Nations Métis Inuit Circle, including Daniel Stevens, an active participant, leader, educator, and co-chair of the FN FNMI Circle. And a shout out, because I see that Krista Markle, the uh, chair uh, of the circle is with us, has been able to join us this morning also. So Daniel will be taking us through uh, the webinar this morning, and we believe it is a fitting topic uh, for National Indigenous Peoples Day to be discussing land acknowledgements. What are they and, what do, and why do we do them? Daniel is going to walk us through a historical overview, and he will also offer some sage advice with acknowledgement ancestral lands across Turtle Island. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel to start this morning's webinar, but before I do, I get to brag about him a little bit and tell you a bit about him. Daniel Stevens is a citizen of Nipissing First Nations and a full-time teacher at Northern Secondary School in Sturgeon Falls. Daniel also privately consults with labor councils, organizations, other unions and federations toward working towards the awakening of Canada that we must achieve before we can honestly examine the truth of our relationship with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Daniel continues to work as an educator, working with the Ministry of Education, boards and schools on behalf of his nation, Nipissing and the Chiefs of Ontario, where he aims to influence indigenous education policies and integration in provincial classrooms. Daniel is an avid coach and brings indigenous ways of knowing of the Mississauga, Miss, sorry, Nipissing peoples to every classroom and to all of us joined here this morning. A father to a child with a significant development delay and a rare condition, Daniel also advocates 
for his child's inclusion as an athlete to perform for his school. We are so honored that Daniel has joined us this morning and that he will guide us through this history of the land acknowledgement and provide insight on how to properly recognize traditional First Nations, Métis and or Inuit territories. After Daniel's presentation, we will have the opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you, Daniel, for agreeing to that. And if you have a question for Daniel during the presentation, please add your question into the chat box by sending your question to questions. You'll see questions on the screen. She's waving at you now, which can be accessed in the Dropbox down menu um, of the participants list in the chat box. We'll ask Daniel to answer those questions at the end of his presentation this morning. So without further delay, Daniel, welcome. And thank you for taking time from your celebrations and time with your family uh, and joining us today uh, and sharing uh, this important teaching with us. Daniel, take it away. So Ani, everybody, um, my name is, uh, my given name is Daniel Mark Alsa Joseph Stevens. Uh, it's, uh, it was given to me at birth. It's what it says on my, uh, my birth certificate or what some people refer to here as our birth receipt. Um, and then uh, I was also fortunate enough that my name is also called uh, Keeper of the Down Rivers. Now that's my spirit name and that's sort of how I'm referred to um, within sort of traditional settings. Interesting enough, also, um, I also have a third name. Um, my Canadian Indian status name is 22001818801. Uh, I am a citizen of Nipsing First Nation. Uh, I am of the Snapping Turtle Clan. Uh, and I live on territory, on traditional territory, in sort of what Ontarians would call um, Sturgeon Falls, Ontario. So that's sort of, uh, you know, more the, the, the common name to use. Um, as Janice said, I am the father of three uh, quite wonderful children, all um, with their own special gifts and unique talents. Uh, my son has some severe uh, developmental delays and some rare conditions that we do have to struggle with uh, at home. Um, but my know my daughters will um, definitely take over the world and make sure that their brother is well taken care of uh, as they grow up. So I'm, I'm quite fortunate to have, uh, you know, so many strong women in my life, uh, my mother and my gold miss and, and my wife, uh, especially, um, who definitely spend a lot of time, you know, taking care of my son um as we all do but you know there's always a special place for 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 boys in, in the hearts of mothers um so without any further ado today we are going to be talking about land uh, acknowledgements what they are why we do them you know we didn't see this 15 years ago you know why all of a sudden these things come up so we're going to be talking about that today so i'm going to share with you my screen and um we'll we'll kind of take it from there um, ask lots of questions. There's, I, oh, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'll tell you right now, there's no such thing as a difficult question. There's no such thing as a difficult answer. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad question. If you have a question, definitely ask it. I will do my best to answer it, but I will tell you point blank, although I have a bachelor of education degree, it does not mean I'm an expert in everything. So I'm, I'm okay with spending the time researching extra information if I need so, uh, need to, and get back to you later on. So, um, like I said, I'm not a pro at everything, but well, don't tell my wife that anyway, but um, I will do the best I can to answer your questions. So um, without any further ado here, I'll just share you my screen and then we'll get going from there. All right, so you should have on your screen now reflecting on land acknowledgements or should be loading up very shortly. So one of the big things, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, uh, working into it, we're going to dive right into it because really that's what this is all about is trying to get to move forward. So there we go. So land acknowledgements. What is a land acknowledgement and, and really what's the purpose of them? Now land acknowledgements, and I'll be quite honest to you, if you ever come down to the, to the reserve, um, especially here in Nipissing, um, you will never hear a land acknowledgement. And the reason why you don't hear about it is because for us, a land acknowledgement is something that we do innately. It is a part of our culture. It is a part of how we approach life. It is how we approach living. It, 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 is a, it encompasses everything we do at all times. We don't do anything without acknowledging where things come from, 
why they are here and why we may need to access them. And as a result, and, and I'm not talking, you know, it's not necessarily always a ceremony. A lot of times it's simple thoughts. Sometimes it's laying down tobacco. Sometimes it's just sitting in the bush, listening to what the stories are telling us, what the wind tells us, what the leaves, the bugs, the, the plants, the animals. It, it, it really is um, a, a very much a part of who we are. Um, and it's very difficult to, to distinguish between the two, between a process and a worldview. So if you come to Anishinaabe territory, we, we generally do a lot of this stuff on a regular basis, and it is a part of our practice. For example, you may hear, especially today, uh, it being National Indigenous Day, you may see online things like spirit plates. Um, again, this is acknowledging our ancestors. This is about acknowledging those who aren't at our tables um, and setting a special place for them so that they can join us. So this is why you won't see land acknowledgements necessarily in on a reserve or within proceedings um, for Indigenous peoples, because it's ingrained in the way that we, we practice and we, we participate in the world. However, that's not always the case. And there are times where, we, where you may see a land acknowledgement being done. So there are things that do need to be considered when you're looking at or about to do a land acknowledgement. The first thing you need to understand, and this is very important, you need to present who you are. As I presented myself this morning, now there's, there's different facets to everybody's personality and who you, who you are today will be different than who you are tomorrow. And it was different than who you were yesterday. So it's really important that you sort of, you know, you'll hear the word like center yourself, but it really is a reflective piece that you need to know who you are in this moment. And that means being emotionally in tune. One thing that, that is always very confusing to me is how in non-Indigenous societies, emotions are very much cast aside. You know, people always say, oh, you need to control your emotions. You need to, you know, rise above your emotions. Emotions are very much a part of who we are. Um, as a Anishinaabe person, and you, you can see me on the screen, I'm, I'm, I'm quite bearded, bald, 250 pounds. I'm a six foot guy. Um, and you know what? I'm very much emotionally in tune with who I am. Now, I don't let my emotions run away, but I definitely bring them to the table every time I sit. And sometimes that means that if I'm not in a great mood, um, that means I need to be quiet. It means I need to reflect more. It means I need to spend the time listening and, and, and I don't want to say necessarily behaving, but definitely sort of in the sense that I have to be aware that my emotions will affect other people. And that's a part of who I am. And that's a part of who we all are. And everybody needs to be aware of those pieces. We also have to recognize why you're there. Why is that space important? What brings you to that table? What gives you that privilege to sit in that boardroom, to say the words that you're saying? All these are important. And this is more sort of, you know, people might look at it as a political thing. It's really not. It is about understanding the responsibility, the humility, the pride, the wisdom that you can share, um, and understanding that it plays a significant role as to the space in which you take. And these are very, very important. This is a very important. So again, it, like tied in with your emotions. There's also other background thing, you know, the other things that you bring with you. So these are other things that you need to consider when you do a land acknowledgement. Another thing is, why is it important for, to you or for you or the group to acknowledge the land? You know, it, it's kind of easy in Toronto and, and, you know, and I've sat in Toronto in boardrooms, you know, 20 stories up. Um, I've also had meetings, you know, in the basements. And understanding that acknowledging the land isn't just say, sitting there saying, oh, well, thank you for sharing the territory, uh, you know, whatever Indigenous group your territory is on, thank you for sharing that with us, and, and then we're going to carry on. No, acknowledging the land is more about understanding about, you know, that importance to that connection, connecting to the history, connecting to the purpose of your meeting into also what you're going to be doing in the future. It's about connecting past, present, and future all into one. That's why we do land acknowledgements because land is, is, is a consistency in life. You can't have life without land. It's, it, it, you know, our very 
you know, if you look at many creation stories, right, we had water first, and then land came after. That's how significant it is to life. That's how significant it is to us. So we need to acknowledge what has come before and what will come after, as well as what is going on today. Now, this one here is, we'll come back to this one in a little bit. So is a land acknowledgement appropriate? Now, I have a really, uh, I have a really interesting story there. Um, and there are times where land acknowledgements are not necessarily appropriate. Um, and we do need to discuss that as well, because you can create, you can breach a relationship if you're not careful. If you do a land acknowledgement out of a scripted sort of lesson, which is sort of where we, these land acknowledgements sort of started from, um, and you don't consider the first three, then you can run into the problem where the land acknowledgement is no, no longer appropriate. And as a result, you can actually damage a relationship with um, with indigenous groups. And I and I'll I'll explain to you guys that at the end. So let's look at first of all. I want to understand. I want you guys to understand how relation how this relationship works. So land acknowledgments are really important. We understand that land base is sort of one of this thing. And what you see on your screen right now is uh, a map of Turtle Island. Uh, it kind of cut off the tail a little bit, but. Um, as you can see, this is Turtle Island, and these are all the, um, the, 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 the major cultural groups. Now, these are not language groups. These are cultural groups um, of Indigenous people who have, uh, who have lived on Turtle Island since time immemorable. Now, what you notice or what you should notice here is that sharing is very much a part of, 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 of who we are. Um, it doesn't mean we always get along. I'm not saying that. I don't want to romanticize things that, oh, all the indigenous groups got along and it was always people. No, we had we had wars. Um, the story I always tell is here uh, on Lake Nipissing in my home community. We have uh, a set of islands called the Iron Islands. And the Iron Islands, uh, the story goes as this, that they, there was a Huron raiding party coming over to sort of um, uh, take over, uh, you know, my nation. And the water in this area, the wind changes direction rather quickly sometimes. So the, the, the wind was going south uh, to north. Uh, the wind changed north to south. Now, Iron Island finds itself sort of right smack in the middle of the lake. So what ended up happening is, fortunately enough, our warriors at Nipissing saw that the raiding party wasn't able to cross. So they made it to halfway through the lake. The winds changed. They had to camp and settle on, the iron, on iron Island. They, our, our warriors uh, then got into their canoes and in the middle of the night went on uh, an expedition and slaughtered the Huron raiding party. So much so that the blood of their, uh, of their warriors stained the rocks red for all eternity. Now that's not a love story. I don't know how you shake that. That is not a love story. Um, and like I said, we, we didn't always get along. Okay. And, and I want to sort of stress that. However, we did sort of make agreements now we have trees and you might have heard of some such as wampum belts that is a form of treaty but we also sort of had this understanding that we ate different foods we use different resources we had different cultural identities so, so as a result we we moved around with a lot of the resources now that's not migratory in any way of shape or form for example i own an ice shack i own a cottage i own a camper and i own a home um, I occupy all, all four of those at any given time during the school, during, during the school year, sorry, during the, 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 the year, um, depending on what I want to do. If I'm ice fishing, I might sleep on the ice shack for a couple of days. Uh, if I'm hunting, I might go into the camper, depending on where I parked it. If I want to go relax, I go to camp. If I want to stay at home, I, I live in my home. That doesn't mean I'm migratory. It doesn't, it just means that I occupy different spaces at all times. So the notion of my, of being migratory really doesn't exist. We had larger concepts of uh, territory use. We had larger concepts of uh, resource usage, things like food and plants and waterways and so on and so forth. So it was a very, you gotta, we, we have to sort of think of things differently. Now, because of that, because of all these resources, you can see on the map, there's quite a bit of overlap within our territories. Um, and I can kind of show you here real quick. Uh, there you go. Um, so you can see sort of I'm sort of right in that little area right here. That's sort of where I'm from, uh, the Anishinaabe areas. And then you can see Anishinaabe Waki there, um, which is sort of the larger group. Uh, the Cree we shared with them. 
we shared with the Métis, we shared with uh, our territory actually expanded down in here. You can see the Haudenosaunee is, is the Mohawk area is down here. So we shared these territories and but we used different resources. And so as a result, people were in and out of the territory uh, depending on what they needed to use. And we created certain, sometimes we had treaties, sometimes we fought, it, it is what it is. But what's important to understand is that this level of relationship, this, these interrelationship between these very, the various nations here still exists today. This hasn't been wiped out. This hasn't been removed. This still exists. We still follow these general rules. Um, when we approach an, another nation, we have, or when we go on another nation's territory, we have protocols that are ingrained in our societies to allow us access, to allow us how to approach somebody, allows us to enter their territory in a peaceful way. So I, I don't want to make you guys think, that, oh, this is, you know, prehistoric. This is pre-Canada. This doesn't exist. No, this is current. This is today. This is June 21st, 2021. This, these, these overlaps, these relationships still function, still work. Um, and as a result, this is something that we, this is another part of, of, of the land acknowledgement piece is understanding you, you know, depending on what territory you're on, you would be on the territory of shared peoples. And that's why when you hear, you know, sort of a scripted uh, land acknowledgement, you have a, a significant amount of Indigenous people who claim that territory. We really need to move away from the Eurocentric model of the idea of, oh, there's a firm boundary. And I'm going to show you something uh, uh, in a little bit that there are firm boundaries. The boundaries were very, like I said, very malleable, very soft. And the reason why was because of what we ate, how we moved, depending on the seasons, we may have occupied that territory as well as another group on a different time, just in order to keep peace. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about land acknowledgements and the list and saying, well, why are we, you know, why are they listing off so many? And that's because it was a shared space. It was a space that allowed various cultures to use and access and we have amongst ourselves our own agreements our own way of accessing territory that has to be recognized and acknowledged now i'm going to show you guys another map um, and this is another map um, this map here is quite interesting this map is the uh, true map of canada um, this is what canada actually looks like is with all these sort of you know, pieces. Uh, and all these pieces are the treaties. This is actually what allows Canada to exist. Without these treaties, and, and this is actually in the Constitution, this is actually referenced in Section 35 of the Constitution, which makes reference to um, a Royal Proclamation. Uh, and as a result, this is what Royal Proclamation sort of did. And this is the creation of the treaties. Now, we're going to get into more detail about them. Uh, but just keep this in mind. We'll keep coming back to this map because it plays a significant role. Now, this is what Canada, most people, most Canadians sign to see as Canada, right? Quebec, you got 10 provinces, three territories. Now, what's important about this is also is that this map is very much young. It's very new. It's actually only 20, you know, roughly 21, 22 years old. And the reason why I say that is because when I went to school, when I was learning uh, about Canadian geography, um, none of it didn't exist. I graduated high school in 1999 uh, when Nunavut was created um, and established within the, the parliamentary system of Canada. Now, Nunavut has always existed. I'm not saying it hasn't, but I'm saying within the parliamentary system of Canada, it was finally recognized uh, as a territory. Um, and the reason why is because of exactly what I said before, the treaties. The treaties are what allowed Nunavut to enter the parliamentary system. Now, I'm being very cautious with my wording here. And the reason why is because I do have to be cautious. Um, none of it always existed. The Inuit used that territory, has been using that territory since time immemorable. By signing the treaty, the, the, the none of it, or the, the Canadian version of none of it, if you want to put it, enters the parliamentary system. So very different, uh, like I said, the languages are very important to, to, to kind of um, to, to, to be cautious about when we're talking about this. And as you can see, you got Quebec, Ontario, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia. But the idea is that this map is constantly changing. 
And believe it or not, this map is actually very much incomplete. Um, there are swaths of land that have yet to actually be treated off and actually belong to um, the various indigenous cultures of those areas. Um, and Canada sort of just sort of blanket washes them over uh, as though they were theirs, but it really hasn't quite come to there. So let's sort of take a long step back now. And I realize I just threw a whack load of information at you. Um, let's take a little bit of a step back and sort of understand how this came about. How did this relationship come about? How did Canada sort of come to be? Because Canada, like I said, is a very young, very uh, dynamic place. Um, and I mean that in, in the full sense of the word, the dynamics of Canada, the look of Canada changes practically on a year to year basis in many cases. And we're going to go through that process. So let's sort of take a really far step back and we're going to go way back to some, some, you know, a couple hundred years, which isn't really that far back in the grand scheme of things, but let's go back a few years to around the 1700s. Now what's important to understand at the 1700s, you know, it's often referred to as Canada, but it really isn't Canada at this point. It is called New France. And this is all from a European standpoint. I, I, I don't want to, you know, from, from our perspective, from, from our perspective at Nipissing, um, at around 1700s, we had some dealings with Europeans through voyagers and some explorers, but we really had very minor dealings with them. Um, New France was really sort of, uh, uh, will become New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, um, and, and sort of uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, that's sort of really New France uh, at this point. And there was a major war. What's important is that there was a major war going on amongst uh, Indigenous groups, the Huron, uh, uh, the, the Algonquin, the Anishinaabe people. There, there was a, a massive feud going on. Uh, and they wanted peace, like all, you know, like all people, they wanted peace. So in 1701, there is a treaty that is signed. It's called the Grand Paix de Montréal, or the Great Peace of Montreal. Now, what's interesting to understand is that our chief, Chief Shibajashik uh, from Nipissing, actually went to Montreal in seven, for 1701. And I say for 1701 because he actually left in 1698. He left 1698. He left. Nipissing territory. He left his people with his entourage and then he went to Montreal and he went to Montreal in order to sign this treaty. So that's how big a deal it is. Now, I get in my car today, it's from Sturgeon Falls, which is on traditional territory, sort of smack dab in the middle of it. And I drive to Montreal. I can be in Montreal eh, about eight hours, eight, nine hours. I can make it one day, no problem. In 1698 and 1699, we're talking years of, of paddling, years of, of being away from your community. This is how big this was. This wasn't this this minor thing. This was this was a major. This was a major thing. There were no highways. There were no airplanes. There were no trains. It was nothing like that. It was literally canoes, portages. You had to make up camp. You had to eat. You had to do a whole bunch of stuff. So this wasn't something that was just you know pack up a lunch and we'll stop off at McDonald's on the way. It, it, this was a big undertaking. And what was interesting about La Grande Pede Montréal was that it was the first time, it was the very first time where they allowed settlers, they allowed the governor of Montréal um, to actually manage the peace. Now, the problem is, is the territory was so large, it broke down within a couple of years. Clearly, uh, whoever is governing in Montréal would not have the ability to control the Huron and Nishinaabe relations out in Nipissing, nor would they have the resources to come out here and deal with that. So... It broke down very quickly, but it was really a really interesting time that it allowed, it did was the first time where it allowed it to happen. It allowed an outside arbitrator to sort of manage the peace, um, which again is, is very sort of endemic to sort of the foundation of what will come later on, unfortunately, which will then be abused and used in, in a negative way. Now, we do have some interesting treaties that are signed now in 1725. And like I said, I realize it's a bit of a history lesson, but we want to sort of, again, understand that this is new France. So in 1725 and 17, between 70, 1725 and 1779, I apologize. Uh, the Atlantic peace and friendship uh, treaties were signed. Now when we're talking about the Atlantic peace and friendship. We're really not talking about the Lawrence Seaway. We are talking about Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. These were a series of treaties that were basically one pagers nobody really had to report to the king of france no one like no one actually did that uh back then and in 1760 uh when there was a change over our hands and we're going to get to that in a little bit um the the king of england actually required these treaties to be signed 
So this was sort of an understanding. Now you got to realize the understanding was as follows. It was basically settlers coming to 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 La Nouvelle France or coming to Turtle Island, and what they were actually trying to do is survive. Okay, the, the climate and the weather in France is very different than the climate and weather in on Turtle Island. Winters are significantly different. The 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 food, the the resources are completely different. Um, a lot of the skill sets you need to survive in Europe are not applicable to this to the survival tactics here in in on Turtle Island. So the peace and friendship treaty was basically, you know, all the settlers saying, you know, we want to survive winter. We want to survive uh, through. Can you help us? We'll give you guns and and metal and and things like that that'll make your life easier. Um, if you give us the, the knowledge and the ability to survive these winters. And so there was, again, right, this peace and friendship. It wasn't about war. It was about literally helping each other survive. And, and, and I, I'm not going to play, you know, the, I'm not going to play the, the, the devil's advocate on that. You know what? A, a gun is a lot easier to hunt with than, you know, bow and arrow and a spear um, when it's about survival. So, um, this is why the, the peace and friendship tre treaties were done. And many of them weren't written. They were just written down sort of later on and then consolidated as a group. So uh, just to give you an idea again, just to go back, we are talking about this area. This is the only area that is covered through peace and friendship. A lot of times people will assume that the St. Lawrence Seaway is covered. It actually isn't. Um, uh, documents have actually quite readily proven that we are simply talking about um, you know, that uh, in the sort of, you know, New Brunswick and uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, PEI is actually not even a part of that group. So there's a changeover um, that does happen um, in 1760. Now, what is important to understand is that there is a seven year war, the seven year war occurs. Uh, and in 1763, England gained control, gains control of what they refer to as the New World. So from France, um, it's also referred to as the French and Indian War, uh, British win, the, the British win, obviously. Um, so what ends up happening is that now there's a turnover. Now, what happens is there is that the King of England is actually practically bankrupt at this point. Um, there was a deal with Britain. Uh, Prince Rupert did create a, a, a deal uh, with the King of England uh, in order to fund uh, the war and help fund the war um, that allowed him to sort of create what they call Rupert's Land. And that was very much formalized after the war, um, although it was in operation well before the war. OK, so if you look at the documentation, the presentations were done to, to the British monarchy before the war, and that's how the war was more or less financed. Uh, and then after the war, this, you know, this was very much well formalized. Now, what's interesting about uh, Rupert's Land is that in Rupert's Land, what ended up happening was that it actually turned into a company that we know today, and that's the Hudson Bay Company. Um, the Hudson Bay has played a very substantial role in sort of the development of Canada, positively and negatively. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, Hudson Bay blankets are still something that is often feared about and talked about because they were riddled with smallpox. It was one of the uh, it was a biological form of warfare, um, uh, but Rupert had no actual rights to land ownership. He had, uh, Prince Rupert had access to land resources. So he actually created a whole bunch of treaties with a bunch of indigenous groups sort of out west and around the Hudson Bay area with the Cree and so on and so forth. Um, and it was in order to access things like, you know, beavers, pelts, and, and, and wood, and uh, all the resources that we generally associate with the voyageurs. Um, and this is really something that has, go this was going on, but these were not land, this wasn't about land conquering or land ownership. It was about, it was literally a economic deal or economic deals that were going on. Now, Canada will exploit this later on, but right now that's sort of what the situation looks like. Um, a very important treaty that did come about uh, slightly after, because like I said, uh, the King of England was practically bankrupt at this point, uh, in 1763 was Royal Proclamation. Now, the king didn't want to have another war. He couldn't afford it. Um, he, he had promised all this land to Rupert, uh, Prince Rupert, and, and it, had to, it had to sort of start paying dividends for him as opposed to funding the war effort. Um, so he created a, a legislation, a proclamation called Royal Proclamation. Now, this Royal Proclamation is, is really the foundation for the treaty, the treaty system. 
It's what will later on allow for um, loyalists uh, to come into Southern Ontario or what will become Southern Ontario. It's what allows for the expansion of Canada uh, through historical treaties, uh, a current treaty system, even the number treaty system. Royal Proclamation is what set that in motion. And Royal Proclamation, and as much as there's the Constitution Act of 1982, Royal Proclamation is still in power. It is still a, a legal piece of legislation. And it's what allows the treaties to be outside of Canada. It's what allows the treaties to be true deals with sovereign nations uh, on an international scale, if, if, uh, if that makes uh, sort of any sense. And I realize that that's sort of a new thing. Now, there was a massive gathering the year after in 1764, it's where they actually gave out the treaties. They got to realize, you know, they didn't have highways and planes and stuff. So things take a little longer to, to, to sort of sort out. Uh, in 1764, they went to Niagara, which was a, a very um, a sacred site. Uh, if you've ever been to Niagara, it's, it's obviously there's a lot of power there. Uh, they gathered and assembled over 2000 uh, chiefs and, and uh, elders and, you know, delegates from various nations. Uh, and the representative of the king uh, handed out uh, wampum, a wampum belt to the nation saying that we would, you know, share this, this, we would share the duty to this, to this territory. Now, there are three belts, actually, um, within that series. Um, there is one called the Covenant Chain, which is the actual deal, which is the importance of shining the chain. We use the silver chain because uh, silver tarnishes and you have to polish it. Everybody has to polish it. It shows the two people, um, the, the, the settlers, the, col the colonial, uh, colonialists, as well as the um, indigenous people holding hands, demonstrating the deal. Then there's the 24 nation belt, and that represents sort of uh, what territories are covered by the covenant chain. And then there's, uh, then there's a final one, which is sort of the retribution belt, which is sort of, you know, how is that going to go by? So who's going to pay what rent? Uh, 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 who has the authority to govern over those territories? Those three belts work together as one. Uh, and like all belts, there were covered, there were copies made. Unfortunately, over time, we have lost a significant amount of them. Uh, and, and no one knows where they are. There is the belief that the covenant chain belt that was supposed to be housed in Europe is actually still in Buckingham Palace and the Queen refuses to pull it out. Um, but we don't know because uh, we don't have access to her archives. Now, what is also important to understand is that between this time, between 1867, which is when Canada was more or less founded by Sir John Macdonald, there's another war that happens. And this is the American Revolutionary War, um, also known as the War of Independence. In this case, however, Britain loses. Uh, he hadn't quite recuperated his costs from the French War, um, the Seven Year War. So, in between 18, 1775 and 1785, there's that Mer American Independence War. You know, we've heard about the Boston Tea Party and that kind of stuff. Um, and Britain loses. So, a new country is more or less created that will become the, uh, the 13 original colonies that they refer to in Britain terms, then turn into the 13 original states for the Amer United States of America. Uh, and then what ended up happening is loyalists actually pushed up. They actually, those who were still loyal to the king, actually settled and they settled in Toronto, they settled in places like Kingston, Ottawa, those places started to settle. So, but Again, this is after 1763. So what ended up happening here is they actually had to sign treaties. Now, these treaties are what we refer to as the concession treaties or often referred to as the unnamed treaties. Um, and essentially what a concession is, is basically, you know what, you've got nowhere else to stay. Well, you know, set up shop here kind of situation. Um, and, you know, we'll, as long as we have a deal and we understand our regulations, you stay on your side, we'll stay on our side, things will be okay or so we thought. Now, concessions happen all the time. I actually own my own house is actually has a situation where my, um, my neighbor encroaches on my territory. When I bought my house, I was told that there was an encroachment. And as a result, I either had the option of one, not buying the house, or two, asking him to move his garage on his, you know, uh, uh, move his garage or two, just leave it be. Now, my wife and I decided we were going to leave it be. 
And that's sort of what has occurred, unfortunately. What has occurred up until just recent years, and we saw with Land Back Lane, is that there was these concessions and these, these cities, like Tr Toronto was a fort before, so was Kingston, and, and these things grew and flourished and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then all of a sudden, these treaties got forgotten. But these treaties still exist. These concession treaties still exist, are still very much important, uh, very much important. And that's why we take you guys, we take Canada to court so often. Um, and that's why, you know, in, in all intents and purposes, generally, um, what's important is also when it comes to these concession treaties, we tend not to lose. And the reason why is because the language is actually quite precise. The language is actually quite clear. So it is very important to understand that we, you know, for a long time, we weren't a part of the Canadian system, but now we are. And because we are, we're able to go within the Canadian system and start sort of talking about, you know, well, you signed a deal. Why are you not upholding it? So that's something that we, we talk about as we go. And as you can see, this is sort of where the concession treaties are. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them, right? There's several treaties there. Uh, the Holloman Track is right here. Proclamation or treaty is there. Uh, and you have a series of other um uh, concessions there and those concessions were specifically designed for you know the loyalists who were coming up uh, as refugees right they were wartime refugees that had lost the war and they wanted to remain loyal to the king so they came uh, up into this way and and there were some sort of in the St. Lawrence Seaway as well I don't want to just pick on Ontario but this is sort of where this is how you get that general shape in 1850, um, again, this is all before Canada. This is still very much British colonies. And like I said, because so many people were moving uh, north and, and you know, the, there was expansion up north, uh, in 1850, the Robinson-Huron uh, Treaty, the Robinson-Superior Treaties were signed, as well as the Douglas Treaties. Now, the Douglas Treaties were sort of way out in BC uh, or what will become BC later on. And Douglas was really... Um, really bad at his job. I'm not going to lie to you. He sort of claimed, uh, if you look at here, he kind of claimed that he had made deals and treaties with everybody along the West Coast. Um, it's not the case. Uh, Douglas was, uh, was therefore uh, seen as a fraud. Um, and it is important uh, to understand it. We'll get into him a little bit when I get back to the, the, the map of Canada. He really only dealt with sort of Vancouver Island and the southern tips of, of, uh, of British Columbia. He really didn't do the whole north and the whole south of the, the west coast as he claimed. Um, another part of the historical treaties is 1923, uh, the William Treaties. Now, the William Treaties are 1923. Um, generally, they... They wouldn't fall under this category, but they were um, th th they were sort of in flux for a very, very long time, and they weren't really solidified until 1923. But there was this general consensus. We will hear things like the dish with one spoon, for example, really is uh, sort of, uh, William Tree sort of falls, falls from that. Um, so there was sort of this, already this wampum belt, the settlers were included later on into that wampum belt to be part of the dish with one spoon. Canada in 1920, uh, in the early 1920s, decided they actually wanted to sort of step out of the dish with one spoon and formalize a treaty. But the William Treaty is really a part, is a fallout from that situation. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it does fall technically under the historical treaties because of that reason, because it's actually tied to a wampum belt, uh, which is one of the only ones that is actually tied to a wampum belt, but it is a fallout from that. Okay, I shouldn't say tied, it's more of a fallout. Sorry, that should be clear. Um, and that's where we get this. So what are we talking about when we're, when we're really looking at the map? Well, Robinson Huron is this spot right here. Robinson Superior is around Lake Superior. That's Douglas right here. Sorry, this is Douglas right here. So see that mess of, of treaties? That's what Douglas did. Now, Douglas claimed he had done all of the Western seaboard. No, he did this. Um, and th there, were some, there are some significant issues. And the reason why is because Douglas really wasn't that great a negotiator and found himself in deep water a lot of times. Um, so he promised a lot of things like self-governance, uh, the right to self-determine, uh, uh, all these other things within trees. They actually weren't ratified with the federal government until much later, until much after 1850. But we sort of give him, I don't want to say credit, it's really not credit because he did such a poor, poor job at it. Um, but it really, you know, the, the, he's sort of, they're, they're part of the Douglas Treaty. So that's sort of a bit of a mess there. Um, when it comes down to it. 
Um, so what are we talking about? Well, this is really where Canada sort of gets its general shape. This is all pre-1867. So before Sir Johnny MacDonald, before, um, you know, residential schools had just sort of started. I'm not going to get into residential schools because that's a totally different sub, uh, subject. Um, but this is really where we get access to Canada. So this is how Canadians, you know, got access to it was through these treaties. That's really how it works. Now, the Dominion of Canada sort of takes form in 1867. And that's sort of when, you know, it's no longer part, uh, it's still a British, it's no longer going to be considered a British colony, it's going to be called the Dominion of Canada. Sir John A. Macdonald creates, quote unquote, something called responsible government, which, you know, I think we can all agree, we don't even understand what that actually means these days, given the political landscape. Um, and he sort of tries to unify and create this, quote unquote, new country. Now, this new country lives on top of that original map I talked about, those original relationships, okay? So this is nothing, this isn't new undiscovered territory. This territory is discovered, it's civilized, it's, 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 it's already inhabited. This is just another, Canada becomes another player on the field, sort of, sort of put, if you want to listen to a sports analogy. So between 1870 uh, and 1821, we have what we call the number treaty system. Now, one thing with Sir John McDonald's was that he has been quoted in saying that he was born a British citizen, he will die a British citizen. So he follows a uh, royal proclamation uh, to, to almost a T. Um, however, his interpretation is quite loose and, and uh, uh, quite vicious. Let's just put it that way. He has also been quoted at saying that he will get rid of the Indian problem. Um, so he doesn't have much love for anybody of Indigenous descent. Um, and he wants everybody to be a British citizen. So several things come into play now. One of the things he's got to deal with is the gold rush. Uh, the US is expanding with their cavalry. Um, they are sweeping across uh, the southern parts of South, uh, Turtle Island and reaping havoc, killing, uh, you know, killing anybody and everybody in their path in order for sort of that Wild West mentality that we've seen on, you know, John Wayne movies. So that's going down south and sir johnny mcdonald's is in a bit of a rush uh he needs to sort of bind what is going to become british columbia right now it's a district into sort of the four original um the four original provinces which is uh canada west canada east pei uh and nova uh, sorry not pei new brunswick and nova scotia pei will enter later on so he's in a bit of a rush. So what happens is he's following Royal Proclamation. Now, the Royal Proclamation states quite clearly that in order to settle, you must have a tree. That is what it is. And there is a new uh, form of transportation on the market, and it's called the railroad and the train. Uh, so people are moving west uh, as fast as they can. So this is what happens. So treaty number one and two gets signed off on, and a brand new province is born. And the brand new province is Manitoba. And there's Manitoba, that little orange box there. That is Manitoba. So in 1870, Manitoba is born. Now, Manitoba looks very different than what we're used to seeing, but that's Manitoba. British Columbia becomes part of Confederation. Uh, treaty number three is signed, and you're going to see sort of this really quick succession of treaties. Uh, treaty number three is signed in 17, uh, 1873, uh, and we get a small expansion, 1874, treaty number four, 18, uh, 1875, treaty number five, eight, and 1908, it's revisited. Now, again, remember I talked about how we had very large pieces of territory. Well, Canadians, Canada didn't understand that. So they met a they met a, a, an indigenous group and they said, hey, look at that. We want you guys to sign a treaty. Now, they didn't say it like that. It wasn't proper negotiation. This is what we're talking. Smallpox, blankets, starving of people, killing the buffalo, so on and so forth. It was literally, uh, 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 you know, they, they were doing everything and anything in their power to get these treaties signed. I don't want to make it sound like it was a nice thing. However, the one thing is that they were signed. Uh, in the long run, which does work into the favor that we can now approach, uh, or th these nations, I shouldn't say we, because I'm not a part of them. Um, those nations can now approach the Supreme Court of Canada and say, look, you guys aren't holding up your treaty, your treaty um, stipulations. So, and they are winning cases. Um, 
because they met them later on, they also signed uh, what they call, uh, 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 they, they signed another agreement sort of expanding the territories of, of these treaties. So you've got, several of these number of treaties will have sort of these, these, these extra pieces, these extra dates. And that's because when they re-met the same individuals they had met you know, a couple of years before, they were like, oh, you occupy this territory as well. And they were like, well, yeah, okay. So we have to add that. Also thing what ended up happening was that Remember I said before, Rupert's Land, uh, Rupert's Land is going to actually, those treaties that uh, Prince Rupert had with those nations is actually going to start playing uh, a significant role because Canada was all, Rupert wasn't about land ownership. They were about economic development, more or less, and quote unquote on that. Canada was all about land uh, conquering or taking over of land. So a lot of times, and what you're going to see here, a lot of times is, some of the times they didn't even deal with the indigenous people. Canada simply dealt with the what became the Hudson Bay Company, and basically negotiated their treaty into their into their number treaty system as well. So this is all a rather complicated uh, uh, battle that has to be sorted out. Um, and like I said, there are significant rights that were never given up that were that Canada sort of usurped, uh, and as a result, well, we know the history. Um, but as you can see, the, the you know, nations are trying to rebuild themselves. Um, and the reason why is because these trees were poorly written or improperly implemented. And now we're suing the cover. Now they're suing the Canadian government and winning. Um, it doesn't take away the, the, the evil that occurred. Um, but at least it sets a precedence that this is their side. This is, you know, uh, Canada side and that those two shouldn't actually be over. They shouldn't be overlapping when it comes to to responsibilities that they're they're redefining them. Treaty number six in uh, 1876 is signed. So you can see kind of really quick, right? 71, the two year break, then 73, 74, 75, 76. All these treaties are being sort of taken over by Rupert, uh, taking uh, back, taken over by Canada from Rupert's land or nego or I don't want to say negotiate or, or more or less, you know, signing under duress. Uh, from Indigenous groups, um, but they are being signed. Uh, as you can see here, uh, no big changes. Ontario and Quebec basically become Ontario and Quebec. British Columbia is still uh, a part of Confederacy. Uh, 1877, uh, we got a bit of a treaty number seven signed off on, uh, and then sort of another map change in 1898. Now, none of these maps are mine. I, these aren't you know hidden. These are actually from the archives of Canada. This You can go online and take a look at them. The, 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 they're public access. Um, nothing's hidden here. Uh, in 1899, 1901, treaty number eight is done. Uh, you can see sort of we have all these sort of districts being signed off. Manitoba sort of becomes a toddler, kind of grown up now. Uh, in 1901, treaty number eight. So 1901 really isn't that far long ago, though, when you think about it, right? These things are still, this isn't ancient history. This is very much modern times. Um, 1905, uh, 1923, treaty number nine is signed. Manitoba grows up again. We have all these district of Alberta, district of Saskatchewan. You can kind of get an idea where that's going to go. Um, Ontario has grown up because of treaty number nine. You can see sort of that northern expansion as they're, they're increasing. Just want to make a very clear note. The Inuit people are still not considered people at this point. Neither are Indigenous peoples uh, within sort of Canadian rule. Um, the law of incompetence, which is also known as the Indian Act, is still very much in power, um, which is just, you know, mind boggling. But anyways, moving on. Um, we get another change in 1905, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Interconfederation, Manitoba. There's a little bit of a connection now between Ontario and Manitoba, but we do see now that there is a connection there between the two. Uh, and there's sort of now this, you know, uh, east to west coast uh, connection. 1906 treaty number 10 is signed 1921 this is an interesting there is a break here and believe it or not there was a whole world war that went down uh between uh, 1914 1918 and canada didn't even have the shape that i showed you what it looked like before canada was still growing and indigenous people fought in world war one and they weren't even considered people let alone you know, and we, we hear about the evils that occurred and Indigenous people went and fought in the name of Great Britain um, during the during that war. And they may not have even have had a treaty, but sometimes there was a treaty and they did so as a treaty partner, right? Upholding the values of a treaty, even when at home it was a bit of a disaster. Um, 
and treaty number 11 sort of is the is one of the last uh treaties that is signed in the number sequence um and like i said i don't want to make it sound like these were negotiated on fair terms they were not negotiated on fair terms uh this is where we get like i said the hudson bay blankets this is where we get you know the killing of the buffalo this is where we get you know the burning of the plains all these things happened during this time frame up until 1921 now the provinces generally take their their shape that you sort of know from now Later on, the last sort of major treaty that was signed is 1949 that allowed uh, Newfoundland and Labrador to become uh, part of confederation. Uh, in 1949, my grandfather was born. It's uh, just after World War II. Um, you know, it, it, like this is really sort of, like I said, this is not ancient history. This is, you know, quite new. My dad was born in 1959, which is only, you know, 10 years after this. Um, so again, not ancient history very very new very very present very very current so going back to this map here like i said douglas is sort of here and then we have all the number treaty system out this way so up until now canada sort of claims quebec it actually doesn't even have a treaty with quebec or anybody uh not any, any nations within sort of its boundaries but it claims it um, and that's followed from the old new france uh, area but we clearly see from Ontario uh, or what becomes Ontario on, you know, they're very, they're, there is those semblance with Royal Proclamation. Now we have sort of these modern treaties. Now these modern treaties are really interesting because Canada actually went to court and lost internationally. Um, and because one of the things is that we're like, at that time, in that time frame, they were actually calling us, you know, the citizen, we were, you know, the indigenous people or Indians of Canada is sort of the term that was being used. Um, as if it was an ownership thing, uh, they they went to court uh, and lost. Um, and as and the reason and the logic behind it though wasn't that we weren't the way the ruling worked was kind of weird. It wasn't that we weren't the Indians of Canada. That's how the court kind of framed it. It was that you can't make treaties with your own people. So Ontario cannot make a treaty with Quebec right? That doesn't work. You can't do that amongst your own. So you have to have what they call, and that's where you're going to see sort of different things. You're going to hear things like land claim. You're going to hear things like final agreements. You're going to hear things like uh, just general agreement. But kid you not, these are treaties. Um, and, and as we are taking Canada to court, as Indigenous people are taking Canada to court more and more and more, it's becoming quite clear that these, th these are just other fanciful words for treaty, that there is a sovereignty, that there is a line, that there is a distinction between the two, that the Eurocentric model of division of territory and division of land is not accurate here on Turtle Island. So the parliamentary system applies, may apply to Canada in whatever it sees as a, 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 as a shape, but it does not apply to the way we operate, like I said before, with our historical relationships. So Canada is just another player on the field. So in 1975, 1978, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement uh, and Northeastern Quebec was signed. So 1975, I was born in 1979, just 75, 78. So very, very close to me uh, when I was being, but when I was born, that's sort of what gives Quebec more or less its shape. Now there's some gaps in there, but it does give Quebec mostly its shape. Um, in 1999, the Nunavut land agreement, land claim went through, and that's what allowed Nunavut to enter the parliamentary system, and it created that territory of Nunavut. Uh, uh, Nisgawa final agreement was also signed, and that is a very important document when it comes to self rights and self governance and all these other pieces. Because again, this was a final agreement. Again, don't I'm not kidding you. This is a treaty. Um, and since then, there have been a total of 26 total agreements. Now, this is actually out of date. There was one just signed last summer. Um, so that has changed again. But again, we can see that there is a total, uh, that there is a general total. So this is ongoing. So in less than 21 years, there have been another total of 26 agreements. So this is more than 26 agreements. So this is constantly renewing. This is constantly growing. Canada is taking different shapes every single time, every single day, almost every single day. So um, again, going back to this, this is sort of now what we're talking about. So all these Northern agreements here, the Inu nation is here, uh, Nunavut, uh, the 
Nagasa, uh, Nagasa Accord is in here somewhere. I can't see it now because it's too small, but it's in here. So we, we can see these sort of accords. And these are these additions. I remember I was talking about how Number Treaty has these little additions. These are the little additions. You kind of see them here. They kind of, uh, uh, they blotted out. And again, this is not my map. This is a map from, you can get this downloaded from uh, Canada's website. Uh, it's all right there. So now let's go back to that. Now that was a massive history lesson. I realized, oh my God, I didn't sign up for that on Monday, especially a, a rainy Monday. I get that. But this is really what gives you access to territory. This is what gives Ontario and Canada and every Canadian citizen access to territory. So when you're acknowledging land, you actually, you know, there is a, there is a process involved in the, in, the, in the proceedings. You do have to recognize the territory. You have to recognize not just that historically it was with, it was somebody else's, but also what gives you access. Remember I said earlier on, I said, you know, we, we, we put down spirit plates and, you know, we, we commune with the spirits. And the reason why is because my ancestors, my ancestors are the ones who give me access to my territory. It's not the treaty. It's not the Robinson Huron treaty. You'll never hear a land acknowledgement on the, on the reserve saying, Oh, thank you to the Robinson Huron treaty for granting me access to my territory that my ancestors have given me for time immemorable. That doesn't happen. What does happen is we thank our ancestors. We thank the deer. We thank the water. We thank the fish. And the reason why is because, because they're there. Because they give up their lives for us to survive. That's what gives me access to territory. My ancestors who have lived on that territory since time immemorable, that's what gives me the access to territory and let, lets me call this place home. Mother Earth, who created all the recesses and bumps that allowed the rivers to flow, allowed my people to settle there. That's what gives me access to territory. What gives Canada access to territory is the treaty. And acknowledging that relationship, now depending on how that relationship came about, whether it was through actual negotiation or some darker evils, it is important to recognize that space. It is important to recognize that you are there to either mend, fix, better the situation for each other. But like all treaties, they're a relationship. And, and that's really what a land acknowledgement is, is about recognizing and acknowledging that deeper relationship, which is land. And to go back to the last question, because I said we, we would revisit it, is that, is a land acknowledgement appropriate? And this is sort of the story I use. Um, I was actually fortunate enough, I was going to an opening. They had built this huge extension on a school. Uh, it was probably rebuild the whole school is really what it was. So the school was practically old and they rebuilt this massive thing. So I was at the, I was at that uh, opening and, and, you know, a bunch of elders from uh, the reserve were there and, and the, the director of education comes up and says, Oh, thank you for sharing the territory with us. We built this whole big school and, you know, it, it's nice to, to see education moving forward and so on and so forth. And, and he hammered on. What I was watching, however, were the elders and the elders were very distraught. You could see they started to get very anxious. They, they weren't comfortable anymore. Um, and this was when land acknowledgements were all very new. I actually went to them and I said, well, I said, I said can you ask me? I asked them, I said, I said, what was going on? And they're like, well, they said, we don't mind that they, they, they acknowledge the land, but we, we wouldn't have dug a big hole and stick a whole bunch of plastic and concrete and rocks and, and unnatural things there. We wouldn't have done that. And then say, thanks for sharing. That's like somebody borrowing your lawnmower, taking it apart, turning it into a leaf blower, and then giving you all the spare parts and saying, thanks for your lawnmower. We wouldn't have done that. I was at Samuel de Champlain's uh, provincial park and it I was fortunate, I was part of the delegate for my nation that time because I have a relationship with the Ministry of Education here in Ontario. And Samuel de Champlain's 40th anniversary and there's a place at Samuel de Champlain's provincial park where they basically clear-cutted the whole area. They clear-cutted this massive beach. Uh, it's a beautiful scene, don't get me wrong. We have the hills and, and, and it's a beautiful scene. So we were walking on the grounds and in, in, in this open field and, and 
uh, one of the Ministry of Education officers came over to my chief and said, oh, you know, thanks for coming. And they're looking around and they're like, oh my God, is this ever beautiful to think that this wasn't here 400 years ago. And my, my chief, she's very witty. She's very witty and without missing a beat, she says, oh, she says, we knew it was here. We just didn't have to cut down the trees so that we could see it. We liked that the birds could see it. We liked that the deer and the moose could see it. We liked that all the bugs could participate in the same view that we, we have all by ourselves today. And it was kind of a, I, I, we all, our delegation from Nipissing sort of chuckled because that's, how, that's why, you know, we tried to not disturb nature is because we believe in the value in the relationship that other things have with territory. If I need to take something, I need to be reciprocal in that and only take what I need. If I take more than what I need, then we have, then it's no longer reciprocal. It's no longer fair, right? It's kind of interesting, right? People in, in, in Canada, you know, you can build high rises that are 40, 50 feet, 50 stories tall and, and fill it up with condos and have a very, very small footprint. But yet the dream is still to have a singular house with a big yard. Well, think about how many trees and animals and plants that have to be displaced in order to have that space. When all you really need is just a small place and you could have a relationship with all the plants and animals and share that space. So that's when we have to look at the appropriateness of an uh, appropriateness of a, of a land acknowledgement is that is what we're really saying about sharing and welcoming and acknowledging the past appropriate to what we're doing in that day. Like I said, with the director of education saying, oh, look at that, we're, we dug a big hole. We stuck a whole bunch of concrete and stuff. Thanks for sharing. Oh, that's like someone putting a wall, putting a hole through your wall and saying, look, I'm going to build my garage right here. Thanks for letting me do that. Well, whoa, what are you doing? So again, when we do land acknowledgements, they do have to be very humble. You have to know who you are, why you're there. Is it important for you to do that? And then lastly, you have to know whether or not it's acknowledgement. These are not things that should be scripted, nor should they be things that are ticked off on an agenda item. They are deeply personal, deeply reflective. There are some mechanics to them, naming the treaty, knowing the processes, knowing whose territory you're sharing with or on. But unless it comes from a place of humility and, and, and self-reflection, they're simply words on a paper. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We want to rebuild that relationship. And we hope that Canada rebuilds that relationship with us. Otherwise, we will continue to have problems. Um, and, and that's sort of, you know, that's sad. Because for th thousands of years, we haven't always got along with other groups, but we have managed not to destroy what is clearly a relationship with Mother Earth. So... That's it for today. Thank you very much, Miigwech, for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, I will gladly answer them, and I will stop sharing right now. There we go. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. Um, as always, uh, there is so much information that you give to us, and I certainly appreciate that you took us in a full circle uh, and appreciate that lesson uh, in between. Uh, unbelievable, the questions that have been coming in, and I, we just have a few minutes, so I wanna get right to the questions. Um, and the first question is, do elected band councils view land acknowledgements differently than elders might? If so, why might that be? Well, elected band councils are from the Indian Act. They're imposed forms of government. So, you know, it depends on what nation you're on. So, for example, here at Nipissing, we're, you know, we sort of 
we manipulated the situation. Let's just put it that way. So our elected band council, the way it works is that we actually only allow, we allow anybody to run. It is what it is. Anybody can do that. But generally what happens is our elected government works very similar to our traditional ways of doing things. So um, we don't generally see them here, but I know several other places. Yes. Elected band councils will be viewed, will be viewed significantly different than um uh, than traditional ways of, of governance uh, and as right and as really so sometimes you'll see you will see sort of these tweaked land acknowledgements uh, because of the band elected uh, situation. Thank you for that. Uh, the second question is I've heard some debate over if it's better to ask and pay an Indigenous person to lead a land acknowledgement versus a settler. What are your thoughts? Similarly, should an Indigenous person be asked and paid to vet the wording, or is that too large of a burden to place on Indigenous folks? Um, that sort of is, a, that's an interesting point, because there are several nations who actually don't want to hear land acknowledgements, period. Um, they actually want to see actions. They don't, they don't really care the words, you know, they're tired of, you know, quote unquote, they're tired of listening to the rhetoric. They simply want to see action. Um, when it comes to vetting the words, I, I think the point becomes a matter of it cannot be a script. It has to be a personal event. It has to be something that comes from the person who is speaking. Um, and hopefully we're moving away from you know, the concept of, oh, we have Indigenous people in the room. Let's let them do the land acknowledgement. Um, that's really what we need to move away from. We need to move away from whoever is, whoever is in charge of that meeting, whoever is holding that meeting. They're the ones who need to do the land acknowledgement. They may seek out advice and, and you know, advice is, is always important to get and, and make sure you're doing it properly. But we need to get away from the idea that, oh, this is an indigenous thing. It, it's really not, this is a relationship thing. And in order for this relationship to build, it, it can't fall on the shoulders of simply indigenous people. It has to fall on whoever is conducting that meeting. And open and open it up to to those to that you know that scrutiny that that understanding that that piece of relationship. Thank you for that. I always remember being taught uh, by someone when we did a land acknowledgement. They knew whose land they were on, right? Mm -hmm. And why would they be thanking themselves for their own land? That's right. And I always remember that. Um, the third question we have, oh, this is good. Uh, what are the best resources to find out more about how each person's land acknowledgement should be constructed? Well, again, right, it has to be a personal thing. So, you know, you can go on nativelands.ca, you can go on a whole bunch of websites and figure out what tree you're on. That's, you know, like I said, there's a whole, I, show you, I showed you guys the map. Um, it really comes down to understanding the nation that you're on and how they, how they see land acknowledgement. Is it something that is appropriate? Like I said, some nations, they don't want them. They want to see actions. They want to know that every time you do something, they are considered. Um, that's a much tougher deal. You know, so it's not about asking permission. It's not about, it, it really is about relationships, right? And, and I think the word land acknowledgement it comes from the West Coast because the practice is so prevalent there, uh, mostly because, you know, th there, there's several nations all kind of bunched together and, and you know, th they weren't as dispersed as us in, in this area. So as a result, the, the, the processes and, and formalities that we see are really from there if you, in, and from those practices. So it's important to just sort of take it outside of that and bring it more into this area and understand that in this place, it's more about recognizing the relationship. Perfect. Thank you for that. Oh, um, and this one I want to know too. Uh, do you have a PDF file of today's presentations you can send us? Yeah, I can. I can make one. That's not a problem. Excellent. That's easy um, answers. I like that one. That's fast. Yeah, an Super easy answer question. Um, okay. The next one is. Uh, how can an organization's acknowledgement meeting on land, on land, if it is personal to the speaker's emotion and reading? How can an organization acknowledge the meeting on land if it is personal to the person's emotion and reason? Well, that's a great question. But you got to realize it, it should be the leader of the meeting, right? So, and we all know that, right? Whoever's 
you know, and, and, you know, words like chairing or, or whatever are being used, but um, they set the general tone for the meeting at the end of the day. So you got to look at it very much like, um, and I, I don't like using this, this sort of analogy, but it, it, it sort of works for, for many people. Um, you have to look at it as a keynote address. That land acknowledgement will set the tone. Now, I'm not saying you go up there and say, look, I'm mad as heck and losing it. That's not the point. The point is to admit when you are in not in a good space, meaning that you have to be self-aware of what your words are using. And I remember we always hear about that people saying, well, I misspoke. This is why that reflection and knowing where you are emotionally is so important because you're setting the tone for a gathering that might be 2000 might be six, but you're setting that tone. So it's important that you are aware of who you are, what your emotional state is so that you don't misspeak so that that relationship can flourish and get better. And like I said, we can be a part of that, you know, that a part of that discussion. I like that thinking of it as your keynote and, and setting the tone for the meeting. I, would, I appreciate that. Um, the next one is, you mentioned land back, Lane, in your presentation. Can you explain more about the movement? Well, I'm not an expert. I think Krista probably be the better, uh, the better one there. But the Holman track is a, is a very, you know, it actually started off as a proclamation. That land was set aside. There, is, there should not have been encroachment. Um, what has occurred, and, and for lack of better wording, essentially is squatters' rights. Um, and that's really where, the, like I said, I won't get into the intricacies of it, but that's, you know, from my understanding of it, that is very much the biggest problem. Um, there are, you know, uh, many of the, the, the developments, cities and stuff like that are squatting on that territory. And, you know, we all know, and it wasn't signed off as a concession treaty. It was a, it, that space was, was dedicated. So it's, it, it's a very interesting, you know, legal case, um, to be honest. And you know what, I, in my personal opinion, it, it's, it's a no brainer deal, but, um, but I understand that, you know, the, the, the courts are, you know, they're going to be cautious. They always tend to be, let's face it, their, their interest in the courts is Canada right? Their interests are not ours. Their interests are Canada. So they're going to look at everything that is presented from anybody else externally. And, and I do see mean that, I do mean that honestly, externally, right? Because anybody who's Indigenous who is fighting for a land claim is fighting externally to Canada. They're going to look at those things with a lot more scrutiny. Thank you for that. Uh, we just have a couple more questions and we've got time for them, I believe. So uh, I often hear politicians like Prime Minister Trudeau referring to Indigenous people as Indigenous Canadians based on the fact that Indigenous nations preceded Canada. Would you please clarify how we should respectively reference Indigenous peoples? In other words, does it feel right to reference Indigenous peoples in relationship to Canada as Indigenous Canadians? Uh, uh, I, I won't answer that, but I will definitely uh, give you the scenario that occurred in BC. So there was a, uh, a mother who gave birth to her child uh, in BC on a reserve. Um, the parents decided that they were never going to, because it was, the, it was a home birth, they never registered, they never uh, got a birth certificate, none of that happened. Um, they were able to get a, a, a status card. Um, the, the, the child was born between two Indigenous people and, and they, you know, they played a little bit of, they played a, a situation here and they actually created a loophole. What ended up happening was, what was interesting is that this child actually got a status card without a birth certificate. This person was actually not even legally Canadian. This person had to apply for a passport. This person had to take a citizenship oath. They were born on their reserve in BC. I think the, the, the moral of the story is, I think the, the, the end of that story is that we are not, if you have a status card, uh, you remove yourself from the jurisdiction of Canada. You are no longer a Canadian citizen. Um, that's what a status card essentially is. And I have one, uh, my children have status cards. Um, it is, you know, there is a reason why, and I said it before during the presentation, the Indian act 
was conceived out of the idea. It was originally, its original title was actually the law of incompetence. That was the original title for the Indian Act. It wasn't Indian Act. It was the law of incompetence. So they were clearly trying to remove anybody with Indigenous roots as being competent in the eyes of Canadian legislation. Meaning that if you're not competent, you can't be a citizen. Right? Back then. And like I said, they still use blood quantum calculators today. So like I, 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 like I said, I won't answer that, but I think the direction of where that's pointed is, is quite clear. I'm sure the look on my face is, uh, <laughs> we'll move on to the next question. Uh, in your experience, is any of the historic knowledge you share today included in the formal Ontario education curriculum? Good question. Um, bits and bits and pieces are. Um, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I've sat on several review committees. Uh, it's curriculum is a weird duck because it sort of only gets reviewed every you know seven to eight years, so everything gets done sort of after the fact. Um, I remember the last review that I was a part of uh, actually was like we actually were telling the ministry you can't do the review because we, the TRC had been formed and we were they were consolidating the results. And then unfortunately, we had to, we missed the review date because we were waiting for the results. The results came after. So then we had to wait another cycle. So it, it, it bits and pieces of it are in there. Um, a good teacher, uh, and there are many, 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 many out there are incorporating this stuff because they're interpreting curriculum in a different way now. So uh, it is there, but not as formal as saying thou must teach this. And much of what I am, uh, am teaching, I teach to my students and I know it has been picked up by several uh, teachers in my district and, and within my area. Excellent. Uh, and that's something we can all certainly advocate for. And I think it's one of the calls to action um, from Truth and Reconciliation, right? And so yeah. we all need to take responsibility for making sure that the curriculum uh, is reflective of that. Yeah. Um, and so the last question I have, and, and we are getting close to our wrap up time. Um, the last question I have is, I've noticed pronunciation is not always the best in land claims. Is there a resource you know of that settlers can use to practice pronunciation so the labor of teaching settlers is not always placed on Indigenous folks? <laughs> My take, I'm, I'm French. I'm bilingual by, I was always born bilingual. So uh, English is a very, uh, is a very difficult, difficult language to learn. Um, I'm French first language. So English is very difficult for me. I only learned English when I was 10. Um, is there a resource? You know what? It, a lot of the writing is like, phon like the grammar is completely different. So phon it's sometimes writing it phonetically doesn't work yeah. either. And that's why you get all these variabilities, I think in the speech and in the, the reading of things. I always tell people, you know what, I'm I, because I'm French first language and, and I learned to speak English much later uh, in grade 10, uh, when I was 10, I mean, I don't really pick on people if they mispronounce things. Um, I do it now. <laughs> um, so I think in all fairness, I think if you're giving an honest attempt, I think if someone, you know, is, is polite, hopefully polite enough to, you know, to make the correction uh, discreetly, not just, you know, you know, yelling at somebody, but I think, I think that's how you're going to learn. And I think the idea is again, right. It's about fostering relationships, right. It, 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 that's not how you, you know, take someone aside and just say, that's not how you say it. This is how you say it. I've done that before where someone has said, I don't know how to pronounce this and then write it out in a phonetic way that they can read it. That helps um, those types of things. It, it, it's just, you got to realize our grammar is very different and we got to realize we didn't work with 26 letters either right like Nishnabe Moen only has uh, 18 letters that we use in combination with our grammar right if you look at French French is another great at language um, but French actually has more than 26 letters because you have all the accents right so you add extra letters and symbols to to make it work and it we it, and we did the same thing so I, like I said, I don't want to pick on anybody. I don't think there's an actual really good resources because Honishone is very different than Nishinaabe Moen. We have different rules, different grammar rules. How we're going to write things out is different. I think the best thing is if you're not sure, try to figure it out or at least write it out phonetically. That generally helps. 
And like I said, if you're giving it an honest go, hopefully no one's going to like, I would never, I would, <laughs> I personally would never. And I actually defend somebody who sit there and I, you know, I've had Anishinaabe people not be able to say Honoshone. Like point blank. Well, they're Anishinaabe. It is what it is. Like, you know, we have a different way of reading things. So it's, it's, like I said, I think if there's an honest attempt not to be disrespectful, just to honestly say it properly. And, and, you know, and, you know, to be honest, if it's a fail, you know, just have a little side conversation. That's all it is. And it just takes practice. Uh, I've had the, you know, and you're exactly right. Folks have, you know, called me in and helped me for, to pronounce it. And then you just practice and practice and, you know, until you get it right. Yeah. I always tell people, you know what, I'm French. So like, I don't refer to myself as French. Francais, francophone, franco ontarien I'm not French is French is an English word for me. Like it's kind of a different, you know, like and I kind of look at it in that regard a lot of times. Right. Right. So we're just about to uh, wrap up, but I think that I uh, want to, uh, you know, talk about some uh, work and, and uh, refer over to an action uh, that folks could take coming out of this uh, uh this webinar. Um, so we all know that access to clean drinking water is a basic human right, yet many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities continue to lack safe drinking water, some of them that have been waiting for clean drinking water since 1995. Uh, and I think we need to add into it that the fact of uh, hand washing uh, is the number one precaution uh, to be used during COVID. Uh, it's absolutely shameful that we're not there. ONDP, MPP, Saul, Malakwath, Bill 286, the inherent right to safe drinking water demands clean drinking water for all. If passed, the bill would amend the Safe Drinking Water Act of 2002 to explicitly apply to Ontarians living and working on reserves and ensure that First Nations have access to safe, clean drinking water. Lack of access to clean and safe drinking water is a harsh expression of systematic environmental racism and, and justice delayed is justice denied. Access to clean and safe drinking water for all can't wait. So right now, uh, we're asking each of you attending this morning to join with us and email your MPP demanding that they send MPP Saul's Malamex Bill 286 to committee now. The link to the email tool has been put in the chat. And before you log off this morning, join us in taking action to demand equal access to clean drinking water for everyone. So on behalf of the OFL's 54 unions and our labor councils across Ontario and the more than 1 million workers that, collect, that we collectively represent, I want to extend a huge thank you to Daniel Stevens and the entire First Nations Métis Inuit Circle at the OFL for joining us for this insightful and important teaching this morning.